but uh, you know what, we, we are, are really excited about this theme. Uh, do you even Bible? The Bible is you know, obviously something I'm just massively, massively passionate about. Uh, I'm like into all like, uh, you, know, the, you know people say you don't need to worry about all that theological stuff. Yeah, I love all that theological stuff. I just love delving and I could sit up, you know those like annoying people who sit drinking coffees for hours having you know, meaningless debates about different theological aspects? That's me. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry that I enter you into those discussions and you're like, bro, come on, World Cup's on, let's talk about that. Uh, but so this is like, this is my theme. This is, I'm excited. Uh, do you even Bible? Because I, I'm generally quite nerdy. Uh, that's a, you know, I know you're looking at me thinking that's not the case. Thank you very much. Um, but I actually am. I'm quite, I'm quite nerdy and uh, I kind of own it a little bit. I actually tuck, tuck my singlets in because I, yeah. I, it makes you feel secure. <laughs> Right, it actually, you need to tuck those singlets in. I'm raised on a healthy diet of Star Trek. Have we got any Trekkies in the room? Come on, God bless you, gentlemen. Uh, but, uh, but I also, you know, watch the History Channel, and church history is one of my, uh, one of my favorite topics, just to kind of chill out and relax and get into church history. And I just want to share one story with you from church history. All right, is there any church history lovers in the room? Yeah. Excellent, a couple, so I can probably just tell any story and trick most of you, it's excellent. Uh, but uh, this guy called St. Boniface, probably my favorite guy in, the, uh, in church history, I should say, uh, he lived around in the 7th century AD, and he was from England, and he, he wanted to be a missionary, so he, he jumped, jumped on, on his horse, and he went over to Germany, uh, and he went to witness to the guys in the Black Forest over there in Germany. And uh, see, back then, they were a lot more hardcore than, than probably what they are now. You know, they probably had a better soccer team and didn't get booted out so quick. And, but they were also warlocks and used to worship trees, and they were what's called a pantheist, which means they worship spirits in nature. And uh, they, they had this one particular tree called Thor's Oak. Ever heard of Thor? Ever heard of Thor? You know Thor, the big guy, blonde hair? Yeah. Well, they used to worship this guy, and this tree was their most sacred point in their village. And so Boniface, he goes and he goes to witness to these people and uh, he takes an axe. I'm no missiologist, I'm not an expert in missionary travels, but if you're going to witness to people who worship trees, I'm not sure about the choice of taking an axe. <laughs> he took an axe, he walks up to Thor's oak and he strikes it with one blow. It blows down under the power of God. He then chops it up and builds a chapel to St. Peter. Hardcore, right? See, you guys need to get into church history because the Bible is actually hardcore. Even though, you know, guys like me and, and Christians like us, even though every now and then we could probably be on the propensity of the nerdish side, the fact is that once you get the Word of God into your life, yeah, all of a sudden now with the authority of the Word of God in your life and the power of Holy Spirit in your life, you start living dangerous. Yeah. You start living larger than what you actually look like. And, and so even though I'm like a tall, skinny, white dude, watch way too much YouTube and watch way too many debates, I'm actually, I want to let you know tonight, my testimony is I'm actually quite street. <laughs> I, I represent y'all. <laughs> and uh, that, that's just like, I'm hardcore. I just, I, this is probably not what you, I want you to understand that. Matter of fact, Paul, in his book to the Ephesians, he was giving them like a, a lesson in what the church should look like. And he said, I want you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And I know what he means because once again, I'm just like, I'm from a country, tall, skinny, white boy. But when you get the Word of God in my heart and the Holy Spirit in my life, all of a sudden I'm walking in a manner worthy of my calling. And so all of a sudden now I'm Gangster J. And I want to ask y'all tonight, do you even Bible? Do you even Bible? You're fool, yo. You're fool if you don't even Bible. Because when you get scripture in your heart, the authority of Jesus Christ in your life, all of a sudden you're living a hardcore life. Yeah. Yeah. Living a life of courage, yep. a life of boldness, yep. Yep. a life of adventure, where every day you wake up and you're like, God, what are we doing today? Come on, let's bring it. And no longer is darkness even a worry for you because you are just the salt and the light yeah, to your on. world yep, and you're yep, unmistakably yep. influencing every single aspect of your environment, your country, the worlds around you, anyone who comes into contact with you. You know, there's a verse in the Bible that says that there is a shield of favour around us. 
And that word there, favour, in the Hebrew, if we were to translate it better into Australian, it's probably more uh, contemporarily translated to say delight. That God's delight surrounds us like a shield. And so I can't walk anywhere without God's delight walking before me. I walk into a room and God's delight, His favour, His happiness, His his absolute rapturous joy over my life, it walks in before me. I can't walk out of a room without God's favour following me. I can't walk into a situation or out of a situation without God's delight, His favour, all of His goodness just following me everywhere I go. I can't reach anywhere without His favour going first. And when you get some scripture into your heart and understanding who you are in Christ, all of a sudden, my word, you start living out some of these stories that we see in the Bible. But see, we live in a very postmodern, secularist society, which means that we've kind of been brought up in our education systems and we've been taught to think in a way that separates the supernatural from the natural. We're supposed to separate, well, the supernatural happens over here. You can be religious on Sunday. You can pray to God over here, but you can't bring it into the workplace. You can't bring it into the school. You can't bring it into education. And that everything that we're actually meant to talk about or think about is, is over here. It's scientific and it's postmodern thinking and it's intellectual. And over here, that's that religious mythical stuff. Uh, But I want you to know that in actual fact, the spiritual stuff that we actually have in our heart called the Word of God and Holy Spirit is actually more real than the physical. Because everything in the physical was actually birthed out of the invisible. So you want to get to reality and truth, then you need to actually get into the invisible. But you won't find out stuff like this unless you get into your Word and find out exactly what God has called you to be. But part of that thesis that Paul wrote to the Ephesians and he said, this is what I want you to understand about how the church works. A couple of major points he brought forward. One was the church wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't like Jesus got to the cross and he's like, wow, I didn't see this plan out like this. Uh, what's plan B? I know I'll start a church. No, the book of Ephesians says that the church was actually birthed in the heart of God even before the foundations of the world were laid. Wow. Your plan A. And the reason for that is because plan A is to have a physical, literal demonstration on the earth today that gives evidence that Jesus is Lord. That's your role. That's your job, both individually and corporately. We are meant to be the living evidence that Jesus is Lord. But not only that, that's this life. In the next age, when we go on into eternity, we are meant to be an everlasting display of His glory and His goodness. Amen? Have you ever had a bad hair day? Ever felt down a little bit? Boy, you just think about the book of Ephesians. Just tap your neighbor and say, you know what, God? He wanted to show the world his glory, so he made me. I'm the demonstration of his goodness. This is what you're made for, church. This is the boldness in your heart and the understanding that we get when we actually get into the pages of the Bible. But what we've unfortunately done, we've weakened the power of the Scripture in our hand when we get to this idea that over there is spirituality and over here is literal thinking. And so what we do when there's a disparity between the Word of God and our life, we have a propensity to get the Word of God and bring it down to our existence and our circumstance instead of looking at the truth of God's Word, realising there's a disparity between where I am and where God's Word is and demanding that this circumstance better fall in line with God's will and His Word and His plan for my life. And so I want to ask you tonight, church, do you even Bible? Because if you got into this, man, you'd find out that you're a weapon in God's hands. You would find out that you're absolute dangerous dynamite when it comes to the kingdom of darkness. You can go in there and just obliterate it with the light that's been birthed in your life. And when circumstance and situation comes against you, you've been given the authority, you've been given the truth of God's word that can radically change any situation on a dime. We're going to have a look at the way that we pray. Because often in that same analogy that I gave there, uh, I think we need to probably change the way in which we pray. I I think about what sometimes Bible characters, if they were to live today, what would their response be if they grew up in some of the Christian thinking that we've embraced? Like the woman with the issue of blood. 12 years she was sick. 12 
years she was sick, 12 years. And still at the end of the 12th year, she was like, there is healing in Jesus' wings. But often, in, in our thinking today, I don't know how many of us, and I ask myself this, this in all truth, would I get to year six or seven or eight and think, well, it mustn't be God's will to heal me. What about year nine or 10 or year 11? Oh, well, you know, God heals some people, but it's not his will for me. I've got a theology of suffering. I've got a theology of suffering too. Jesus took all my suffering, so I don't have to. And that was the same theology that that lady had because she just, after 12 years of suffering, spent all that she had on a physician. She still had the boldness and the faith and the courage based on a verse that she read in Isaiah that there would be healing in Messiah's wings. And she said, circumstance, you get yourself up to the truth and the standard of God's Word. I wonder how many Christians today would live with that kind of bold faith. What about Peter walking on water? Jesus walking on water and Peter's like, I want to do that. Let's go. Let's do that. And the disciples, if they were maybe in today's environment of intellectual thinking and postmodern thinking, you might say, Paul, Peter, Peter, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, Jesus not actually walking on the water, bro. It's just a metaphor. It's an allegory. It's a story to let you know that you need to walk on top of your circumstance on the path to Mordor. <laughs> I've got some nerds in here. Yeah, I do. Don't, don't jump out of the boat, Peter. It's just an allegory. It's just a story, man. Uh, but you know what? Peter's like, no, 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 no. I want all of it. I'm going to step out in boldness. I'm going to get out of the boat because the Word of God Himself is walking on water. I'm going to get my life lining up with His. What about the feeding of the 5,000? Oh, you know, sometimes God meets my needs. Sometimes He does, and I just got to work hard. No, no, God saw a need, and He met it. 5,000 of those needs, He met it. There would have been even more than that. But here's the kicker. 12 baskets of abundance left over. You know, we kind of think, well, God just meets my needs, that's it, pays my electricity bill, and that's enough. Thank Jesus, I I'm, you know, paid the credit card this month. No, God wants to give you more than enough. That He actually, the blessing of the Lord makes it rich, and He adds no sorrow with it. That actually, it's the, it, it, it's the Word of God. He wants, he wants to teach you how to profit and lead you in the way in which you should go. All of those are verses that if you would understand and grasp into your heart, 12 baskets of leftover in abundance, that makes sense to me. We got a picture of Jesus that, you know, that he was poor and lowly and didn't have anything, wasn't actually, a, you know, a blessed man. I don't know what a poor man needs a full-time treasurer walking around with him for. I mean, was he sitting at the ties and offering bucket, watching the widow put two mites in there? Was that because he was like, he was waiting for some change that he could put his offering in and get some change out? Was that why he was sitting there? I don't think so. Jesus wasn't on the planet more than three minutes and three blokes turned up and gave him gold, frankincense and myrrh. The boy was rich. And as Jesus is, so are we, is what Scripture says. Jesus taught us how to pray. He said, you know what? This is why I want you to pray. As it is in heaven, so let it be here on earth. But I think sometimes Christians get caught in the snare of praying, God, help me deal with my earth. Help me get through my earth. Help me survive my earth. But that ain't the way Jesus taught us to pray. He said, bring heaven down to earth. So if you're healed in heaven, you're healed here. If you're whole in heaven, you're whole here. If you've got abundance and provision in heaven, you've got abundance and provision here, according to Scripture anyway. Do you even Bible? We're going to have a little look at, at the story of Lazarus. You see, Lazarus, uh, he was a friend of Jesus. Matter of fact, when Lazarus died, sorry, spoiler alert to the story, uh, when Lazarus died, one of the most profound theological statements in the Bible happens in the shortest verse in the Bible. In John eleven thirty five. 35, it says, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. In that short two-word statement, so much profound theological implications are given to us, first of all, on the deity of God, that God himself feels and understands and can put himself in our suffering 
and actually bring himself down into our circumstance and environment and can actually feel the pain and understand where we are at. But it also spoke to the humanity of Jesus, that he truly was human and actually cried at the death of his friend. But we're going to fast forward a bit of the story because Lazarus has already been dead four days by the time Jesus turns up on the scene. Four days is an odd number, but in Jewish times back then, uh, you weren't considered dead unless you were dead three days. Uh, no, because they, you know, sometimes got it wrong. They'd be like, this guy's dead. And then after day two, he'd get up and be like, oh, didn't see that happening. So, <laughs> so they decided, okay, well, that's happened a few times now. Let's not bury people unless they've been dead three days. And so they would wait three days before they bury someone. But that was day four. So, I mean, Lazarus, he's dead. He's dead, dead. He's dead with a capital D. And starting to smell, that's how dead he actually is. And this is when Jesus is turning up. And in verse 21, we'll pick the story up. It, it, it's talking to Martha here. You've heard Martha before. Mary and Martha, you've met both of them before. Mary is the lady who broke out the alabaster box to, as, and anointed Jesus. Martha is the one who was cooking in the kitchen and she got all cranky because Mary was sitting down not doing anything. And, and so Martha started complaining. Uh, that, that, that's the Mary and Martha and Lazarus was their brother, just to give you some context. And in verse 21 here, It says, Lord, Martha, complaining again, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Oh, who's prayed one of them before? All right, I'm going to change my sermon to lying. (laughs) We obviously need to deal with something here tonight. I think we've all prayed that before, haven't we? Lord, if you'd been here, I I wouldn't be in this situation right now. God, if your promises were real, I actually, uh, this death and destruction and sickness wouldn't have actually come into my life. Uh, See what we're doing there already? See what Martha's doing? Word of God, truth, God's plan, God's will, our situation, our circumstance, we're bringing the Word of God down. Jesus, if you had been here, my situation would have turned out different. Uh, Same thing. Turns out Christians 2,000 years later are still doing the same thing. Not in this church. But even now I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Uh, This is the second Christianese statement that Martha's busting out here. I mean, this actually probably sums up a lot of our uh, evangelical Protestant understanding of salvation, actually. I know one day, someday, I'm going to get to heaven. I'm going to get a golden ticket. I'm going, to let to, I'm going to be able to live in the perfect paradise of God. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to be healed, saved, delivered. It's going to be awesome. Uh, but here down on earth, uh, I've just got to suck it up. I've just got to you know, live with my suffering down here on earth. But one day, someday, I know one day, my brother will rise again in the resurrection, Jesus. But that's not what... Jesus was talking about and actually he actually corrects her he says he says Martha I am the resurrection and the life he who believes in me though he may die he shall live and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die do you believe this Martha and my question tonight to you is do you believe this that the resurrection is not just an event that happened 2,000 years ago or an event that we're looking forward to after a whole bunch of years on this earth where we're not living with heaven on earth. Do you believe that resurrection is not an event? Resurrection is a person and his name is Jesus Christ. And if you have Jesus in your life, you've got resurrection. You got resurrection in your family. You got resurrection in your health. You got resurrection in your finances. You got resurrection in your career, in any situation or circumstance. There's resurrection because you have the person of resurrection, and his name is Jesus. Yeah. Come on, do you even Bible? I told you I'm hardcore. Y'all thought I was a nice pastor. She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Martha's doing great now. She's dealing in Christian creeds. She's gone from Christianese to Christian creeds. She's now just delving into statements of faith. She's just confessing what she thinks that she has to confess, what's on the church website as our doctrine of faith. That's what she's confessing, what she thinks is the right answer. 
Dallas Willard has a great insight to this. Dallas Willard's probably one of the greatest Christian authors when it comes to spiritual formation and discipleship, dazzling mind in those areas. I love what he has to say to this particular point. He says, we have a multitude of professing Christians who well may be ready to die, but obviously are not ready to live. Have we got a church who, you know, great confessing Christians, got their creeds down pat, got their Christian knees down pat, that very well may be ready to die, but are they ready to truly and really live? Are we ready to be the evidence that Jesus is Lord? Are we ready to live with the boldness and the courage that it's going to take to actually say, I'm not going to accept the standards of this world and the level of my reality, but I'm going to demand that the level of my reality be raised to the standard of the Word of God. Is there any courageous Christians who can live in the boldness, that can walk in a manner worthy of their calling? I told you, I'm street. And so are you. This is the point. If a nerdy guy who tucks his singlets in and watches Star Trek can be this bold, so can you. I love what Jesus says next. He says, where have you laid him? I love this point. I just chucked this in mostly because I just love this part of salvation. Because this is obviously points out to the fact that we don't receive Jesus because we went looking for him, but because Jesus came looking for us. That while we were still sinners... Christ loved us, that He actually left the 99 and pursued the one, that He actually left the nine coins and He searched for the one, that the prodigal son, when the dad was out looking all the time for his son to return, once he saw him, it wasn't that the son ran to him, but the father, he ran to the son. Jesus came ran, running and looking for you. Where have you laid him? I love the part of salvation that, that points to the fact that You're here because Holy Spirit wooed you and pointed you to Jesus who was longing and looking for you. You're the pursued bride. Martha says, well, he's actually in the tomb, which is the part that Jesus wept over. And he speaks to Martha and he he says, take away the stone. Take away the stone. And Martha's like, "Um, Jesus? He's been in there four days and there's a stench now. That's how long he's actually been dead. First of all, Jesus removes any barrier between us and him. He says, take away the stone. Jesus has taken away the stones that were the hindrances of us getting into relationship with God the Father. There were some big stones in our way, but Jesus took all those stones and he rolled them away. But, but I love the stench part. Uh, Mary and Martha are like, man, you do not want to do that. He stinketh, <laughs> is the original Hebrew. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But Jesus is not worried about the stench. Do you know God's not worried about your stench? Your stench doesn't phase God. You know those people who say, oh, I couldn't walk into a church, the whole building would fall down. (laughs) No, it wouldn't. Your stench ain't that bad. And it's not even that the stench ain't that bad. I mean, there is a stench there, no doubt. I mean, you're dead. You are dead. There is a stench to your life. But it's, you know, compared to the love and the light and the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ, your stench is absolutely insignificant. It would only take one drop of Jesus' blood to wipe out all your stench and also the rest of humanity's stench as well. There ain't no sickness, no disease, there ain't no death, there ain't no curse that could actually stench enough for Jesus not to say, take away the stone, the hindrance, the blockage, I'm coming in because I'm pursuing him. Where have you laid him? And this is the part I really love because, you know, this is the part where we get to get our Pentecost on. Oh man, I'm an old school Pentecostal, you know, like I was born and raised in the old school Pentecost days, yeah. You know, where we actually used to, joy is the flag flown high on the Pentecostal two-step. That's me, man. Come on now. I'm loving it. I've always wanted to be a good Pentecostal preacher. And if you're going to preach a Pentecostal sermon, telling Lazarus to come out of the grave, man, that's, that's where it's at. That's where it's at. Because Jesus stands 
at the door to Lazarus's grave. And he calls that familiar call that anyone who's come to know the power of Jesus' salvation, you've heard this call. You've heard this call. And you could really, you know, you could really work this section up. You could be like, Lazarus, ha! I said a Lazarus, ha! And la- you mean, you could get into it. I wish I wasn't as wide as I am, I really do. But Jesus stands at the door of our life while we were still experiencing death and destruction, disease. And He calls us by name and He says, Lazarus, I want you to come out. Come out of your death. Come out of your sickness. Come out of your disease and your situation. Come out of your stench. I've got some life for you, Lazarus. I want you to come out now. And that's where we come to know the power of Jesus' salvation. And if there's any witnesses in the room that has experienced a call from the name of Jesus, when He called you by name and He said, I want you to come out of your powerless situation. I want you to come out of that death in that situation. Come out of your hopelessness. Come out of your brokenness. That's where we come to experience the life of Jesus. And we do, we we come out of the grave. We answer Jesus, we say, yeah, I'm coming out. And you know what? I'm gonna give you an opportunity to that same call at the end if you haven't answered that call yet. But we're gonna get back to that because I've got some other business to do first with the rest of those who have already answered that call. You've already come out of the grave. God's already reached into your life and brought you out of death into life, out of darkness and, and into light. He's already totally radically changed every single aspect of your life and He's brought you out of that situation of death. But see that there's a problem with Lazarus once he comes out. Where's my Lazarus? I want you to see this. Lazarus comes out of his grave. This is Lazarus coming out of his grave. But see, there's a point to where Lazarus, he comes out, but Jesus notices something about the life of Lazarus. I mean, he's saved by now. He's come out of death into life. And this is where he's at still now, but there's still more work to do in the part of salvation. And Jesus actually starts speaking to the life of the believer because we're meant to be the evidence that Jesus is Lord. We're meant to be the living evidence in our life that Jesus has the power not only to bring us from death into life, but also that He's a glorious God that actually totally changes and revolutionises our whole life. Salvation is not a golden ticket to get into heaven, but salvation is when Jesus comes and totally saturates every single moment of your life and brings life into every single second of your existence and every single facet of your being. That is what salvation is. And so Jesus isn't satisfied with the fact that Lazarus is just out of the grave. Jesus wants more because He notices that Lazarus still can't see. He's still seeing without his spiritual eyes. He can't see the goodness of God, the presence of God. He can't see the grace of God. He can't see all of God's goodness that He wants to bring into his life. And so he he says, I I need you to take the grave clothes off. I I need you to take off the sight of his ability to see. And, And they do, they start taking the grave clothes off so he can see. But he still, he's a good looking Lazarus, isn't he? You thought Lazarus was older, didn't you? It's good looking. But there's still a problem because his hands are still tied. But God has called us to do work. Hand often represents blessing in the Bible. And you can be saved, but see, you're not just called just to be saved. You're also called to be a blessing and unmistakably influence your world for good and for God. But if you've got tied hands, you've got to take your grave clothes off. And so Jesus, He says, He's still bound. He's still bound. I need you to actually loose Him. I need you to actually untie Him. And so Jesus actually goes to the point. Now remember, this guy's saved already. Lazarus is already alive. We're going to take some grave clothes off tonight. Because Jesus, He wants your hands free. He wants you seeing all of His goodness. He he wants 
you to be able to walk and actually bring the Gospel and actually be effective. How blessed are the feet of those who bring the good news. God wants you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. He's called you to walk as the evidence that Jesus is Lord. And so the great Pentecostal sermon of Lazarus, ha, come out of the grave. We love that part. But tonight, we're gonna take some grave clothes off because even if you are already out of the tomb, God wants you healed, saved, delivered, living in His fullness, living in His blessing, living in His prosperity, having every single facet of God's love and His grace. There should not be brokenness in your life. There should not be a, a, a hole in your heart. There should not be healing and sickness in your life. And if there is, that's okay. Because notice, even after Lazarus came out, it's okay. Lazarus didn't get rebuked for having grave clothes on. He's not in trouble for that. Jesus didn't speak to Lazarus about the grave clothes. He spoke to the grave clothes and you have to speak to your grave clothes too. You have to say, Jesus has actually set me free from this. Jesus' instruction to Lazarus and to those around him was loose him, let him go. And Jesus is speaking to your sickness tonight and He's saying to the sickness, loose him, let him go. He's seeking to the brokenness of your life and He's saying, loose him, let him go. He's not speaking to Lazarus, He's speaking to the things that He's healed you from, He's saved you from, He's redeemed you from. Come on, let's stand and raise our hands to heaven right now. And the freedom.